Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Maybe. Sorry, I think it's mine. Oh, okay. I, I said that. Yeah. I I said that. My I think that my problem is more understanding the basic of APIs. I I don't really know how it works and why we are doing them and all around that. I think if I understand that, it will be easier if we go, we go further of uh, by reading them. So if you could help me from there. Okay, so uh, your issue is with the whole concept of APIs, right? Uh, how it works yes. when we use. Okay, okay. Yes, the whole concept. I think if yeah. I if I I understand that I can understand the remaining easy, but I don't know anything. I, let me say it that. Uh, yeah. So I understand. So so APIs are going to allow us to communicate our different type of programs, right? So, for example, if we have, uh, if you, if, if, let's say you're working on a full stack project, that means um, it has um, a front, a front end that the client is going to communicate, right? And then you have the database where uh, you have different type of uh, things that you're storing, or your different type of data that you're collecting. And you have a backend that's going to handle the business logic and that's going to handle what goes into the database, what comes out of the database and how to connect with this database and how to connect with other services that your system might need to work on. So so the whole business logic is going to be at the backend, right? So, um, so your backend can, can directly connect to your database. That's that's uh, you. You do have ways to manage that, but when um, when you want to send uh, information to the user or to the front end, when you want to connect the front end to the back end, like if you have users that are maybe signing up to the, your application, then uh, you'd you'd have to connect the front end part to the back end part, right? So the main connection is going to be done through this APIs. So your API is going to uh, be uh, you, it's going to get information from the your business logic or your back end and you're, it's going to uh, get that information and display that to the front end or send that information to the client code right if you have different maybe I don't know if you're working on a react project then you have uh, ways to um, to access the information that is coming from the back end it could be in a JSON format and you can manipulate that and you can uh, display that on the front end by, uh, you know, maybe adjusting it or something. It might be, uh, so you would usually, uh, when you're uh, sending informations from the back end to the front end or API uh, from, so for information to be accessed through uh, the APIs, use the JSON format or the XML format, so, right? So you can adjust you cannot just dump that to the users. So you would have to manage that. So APIs make uh, make that easy for the front end part that's going to display the information to you, to the users and that's going to get in information from the users. Um, so it's, it's going to make it easier for them to communicate the back end, the front end. And um, so even the back end can communicate with other type of uh, APIs, right? For so maybe if you have if your system has, I don't know, uh, some sort of map in your um, so if you have um, if you want to to have map in your app or in your web app, um, so you might use the Google API, right? So what what that means is that Google provides the API. So how to how to, any type of information that that is connected or that's related with with the mapping, how the map is di displayed, how some functionalities of the, of the map and everything is going to be uh, sent ba sent back to the to your application through through this APIs. So um, so this APIs make make it easy for so transforms uh, so they they're a way for communication and simply put. There are uh, some some sort of intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. So they're usually um, 
So they usually explained in terms of client and servers. So you might have like clients and you you would have uh, that uh, clients that are sending uh, information to the server and the server um, sending another information or another uh, response. So a request, a client sends a request and the server responds with a response, right? So it's usually the, the, ar the architecture is um, somehow a client server ar architecture. And so the application sending the request is called the client, right? And the application se sending the response is called the, re the server. So that's, the, in, in a nutshell, that's what APIs are. And we have um, different type of APIs, right? We have, if you've heard, um, we have SOAP APIs, uh, RESTful APIs, uh, you have RPC APIs, and so there are all different types of APIs, right? Um, so what they are is, for example, let's let's say SOAP APIs are uh, they're mm, okay. They're simple object access protocols. So what they are is they establish a web API protocol. So a protocol can an HTTP protocol can be uh, can be one type of a protocol, and TCP can also be another type of protocol. So it so SOAP APIs extend are intended to be extensible right so they're able to op to operate over different type of protocols uh, like i said http tcp and more there are different types of protocols and so you communicate using over this protocols and they are independent of um, most programming language or most programming styles so soap is one type of api and um so if you have like multiple services if, or if you have multiple programs in your application or if you are working on microservices, so that's something if you have different type of services or that are somehow related to each other but should not be depending on each other, you can use the R RPC protocol, right? Uh, API, right? What RPC is, is a remote procedural call API. So it's a very simple type of API for to to work to work on for the developers, it might be easy to develop, but it might be harder to uh, manage or implement. Or um, um, okay. So yeah. Um, so we have different type of uh, RPC. Is also uh, it could be different, right? Um, it's it's intended. To, uh, so the goal is for a client to execute a code on a server. So you have different, so RPC usually have uh, its own benefits, right? It's, they make it easy for developers to create applications that are, uh, let's say, that are, that have multiple programs or multiple services that should not be depending on each other, but in a way have to communicate with each other, right? So, um, so makes it hard for, uh, so when you're working with SOAP APIs, um, you're, you're usually working with a um, few uh, services, right? You should, it's, you cannot create multiple programs or multiple um, services with using um, SOAP APIs. But in REST and uh, remote procedural API calls or RPCs, are, you can have uh, multiple programs or services. So you can work on, um, different type of projects here and you, you have uh, so in rpc there are two types of um two types of rpc so so i have maybe a slide maybe i can share with you guys um let me just share my screen Okay, yeah. uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, um, are you seeing the slides? Yes, yes. Okay, cool, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, you, we have two types of um, RPC itself. So um, 
we have um, Xamil RPC and JSON RPC. So uh, the Xamil RPCs are the simplest types of RPCs that are de uh, developed, and uh, so th they you it it enables you uh, to make simple requests that to serve via the HTTP protocol, right? So they are easy to develop, but they are tightly coupled, which means it's going to be harder to manage or harder to um, to implement or something. And just if it's easy to for, to make to make them at first, but it's harder to manage. So they're a bit cup, tight, they're tightly coupled, right? So um, uh, in JSON RPC, they're also tightly coupled, but it's it uses uh, the it's encoded in JSON. So it's like the XML RPC, but they they are easy to develop and implement. But uh, they the responses are sent back as a JSON or as a JSON format. So that's uh, one thing about RPC that you need to know. And so the most famous one um, that mostly is developed to these days are the REST APIs. Like I'm sure you guys have heard about it. Even uh, you try to make one, right? So REST APIs are representational state transfer APIs, right? It's a web service API and um, they're part of uh, the modern web application. So they're, um, they're widely used in the web application. Um, sorry. So um, REST APIs are mostly used in a web application. And if you're uh, if you're developing different types of uh, application, let's say web application, it could be mobile application, then this type of they're um, more adapted and they're used in big companies like Netflix, Facebook, and many others, right? So, for your APIs to be considered RESTful API, it it need to be stateless. So one character that you need uh, for for an API to be rest, um, restful API is it need to be uh, it need to have a client server architecture, right? So what that means is that the interface is separated from the backend and the data storage, right? So it's more flexible and you can um, you can add different components that involve each, with each other, and you can communicate or you can maybe um, uh, manage this component as you go along. And um, so um, um, the changes you make on when we're talking about client server architecture, the changes you make on the server. Should, shouldn't actually affect the clients, right? So they're called the separate concerns. So this is what we're working on the server should not actually affect the client. So REST APIs um, should have this uh, should have this property. And this enables each slide to grow and scale and on its own without actually affecting each other. That's that's one character of RESTful APIs and they're so they're cacheable, right? Right? So what that means is um, Okay, so what that means is that um, clients can cache responses, right? So uh, a REST API response must explicitly state whether it can be cached or not. So when you're de developing this APIs or when this when you're programming this APIs, then you have to specify that whether it's it is cacheable or not, right? So uh, where the client side of the REST API can cache the information it's first and ten period of time. So uh, when when you are working on when or when you're accessing the Tenix platform, it's actually stores caches, right? So um, whenever you are dating, uh, it, it's getting the cached uh, response. So you have to delete that. You have to go back and remove the cache or the cookies so that you can access the updated uh, versions right so this is because when it was developed that it was cacheable right it, it made you the trainees access the informations for a certain period of time the informations that you have already accessed right 
the not the new updated ones, but the ones you have access uh, you have um, accessed it before. So, so this reduces the number of times uh, an application needs to load, right? To or to call the APIs. So to make your application fast when you're developing. Um, you don't want it to make the same API calls using the same data for uh, to not not to overload them. You you use this feature and it reduces the server usage and the server resource. Um, so um, so yeah, it's. It helps you to improve your user experience. So this is one quality. And um, so stateless, so what does statelessness mean? Uh, it means that it doesn't actually store the client data on the server, right? No, con no client context is stored on the server between the requests. So you should not be storing your client's information and everything. So it should be stateless. Uh, it means that you do not allow your server to have the information they receive. So in cacheable and stateless, those are different things. So in stateless, you're not storing the client's information. So in but in cacheability is that you minimize or you decrease the time the amount of API calls you make. Right? So in stateless, um um so you allow the server, so you do not allow the, your server to have the or to keep the information from the from the from those that are sending the information, right? The clients. So the client sends information to the server, and uh, I don't know, and it could be in a packet, and and the server can understand and can use it or implement it, but it should not store this um, information. And so uh, it's a layered system. So what does that mean? Is that the, the API will work whether it's communication communicating directly with the server or through uh, an intermediary such as load balancer or something. So you might have um, different type of load balancers. So when, so some, um, let's say on AWS, you have a load balancer, like you have AC2 load balancer or something. So you, your API will work whether it's communicated directly with your server or with your load balancer. So what load balancer are going are is some uh, intermediary that's that's that connects with your servers or services and your API can directly connect to this load balancer instead of the server uh, that that's that's already there. So um, so we have um, different types of um, so these are the main uh, difference between the SOAP RPC and the REST APIs uh, so far. So um, so in REST APIs, we have different HTTP methods, right? We have the we have the GET method, you have the POST method, uh, you have uh, you actually have a lot more than this four. Uh, you have patch, you have delete, uh, you have I don't know, log, you have head. So these are the HTTP protocols that are going to connect that a client uh, sends requests request to the service using some sort of HTTP um, format. So so when, so the, uh, so when, for example, let's say a client sends a guest request to the server, then it sends a, a sends back a, a response, right? This could be in a JSON format, or you can so to test an API. Um, so you can you can actually build uh, APIs using different type of uh, technologies, right? Um, so, so far you've been working, what have you been working on? So, have you guys ever built um, APIs so far? You haven't, right? Maybe uh, if you guys worked with Flask API. Is there anyone that has managed to actually build an API so far? If you don't mind me asking, maybe. Okay, yes, just yes, yeah. Yes, I'd like to say that I've, uh, in week four, I think, yes, I've managed to use the uh, REST API with 
left. Okay, so um, what have you managed to do with that API? Uh, like the API had two endpoints. One mm -hmm. was uh, showing the the uh, the job description extraction because we were, we were we were working on prompt engineering, and the second one was trying to create the uh, yeah it was score prediction yeah so I had two endpoints. Okay. I, okay. I, so, I, I, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I did not really understand, understand what I was doing, but. Um, I, I read a lot and I try to put all I, I learned I learned together in order to be able to do it. So and I use Postman to test it and I think it was working. Oh okay, that's great. So uh which type of HTTP so you, is that a get uh did you use get request to access yes the... I, yes I use get and post first. Okay, so that then that means you actually are uh, aware of APIs and you do have um, some knowledge on them, right? So you are you're familiar with them, so which is good. I didn't think the way you described it before was as if that was the first time you were using the APIs. So now yes. you ah, okay. it's actually different time. It's just uh, I followed. The, the tutorial we had in week four, and it helped me yeah. to understand a little bit. But in last week, it was like I did not know anything because I was not able to do it uh, in, in week six. That's why I was saying that I don't know. It. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, I understand what you meant. Uh, okay, let's talk about this type of uh, APIs, right? What, uh, how we send information to the server and how we actually receive these informations, right? So uh, we have, these are the most, uh, like we said, these are uh, the most uh, common HTTP methods of receiving and sending data to the server or from the server, right? So, um, so in get method, we have the get method is used to ret retrieve data from the server, right? So uh, it's actually a read-only method. So you cannot send uh, or you cannot write to the server. This is when you're using the get method or you're actually just receiving the information only. So it's a read-only um, method. So there is actually no risk of uh, corrupting the data. So. For example, um, let's say, um, so if you're maybe, I don't know, get trying to get, uh, a, if you call a get method, uh, when if you created a, an API that uh, lists uh, trainees, and if you get, if you call the get method, you're only going to get the list of uh, your trainees, right? You're not going to update or you're not going to send back information. So this is just a read only. Um, method and when in the post method you can use the post method to send the data to your server and a client or you can create a new resource using the post so the resource it creates is uh, somehow uh, related to the other to the other resources so when yeah when, so when you are so there needs to be other resources so when you're sending a post request or the post method, it, it creates its subordinates or to that parent um, resource. So when a new resource is posted to the parent, then the API service will automatically associate a new resource. So by assigning it some ID or it could be a, a, a URL or something. So this is a method that's used to create a new data. So you, we use the post to write, you can also use to write um, a new data entry. And so maybe if you're, so if you're working with fetch APIs, then you can specify your method as post and maybe you can specify your body. So um, let me just, uh, 
Uh, let me try and share my postman here. Okay, uh, you can see my postman, right? Yes. Okay, so this is one way uh, we actually taste our APIs, right? So, like I said, the post with a post you can. Uh, so with get get only allows you to to receive the informations, right? So if I send this is just a, a, a let's use this one. So, so this is a famous an open open source API that lets you. Uh, access that gives you an API endpoint and that lets you try out or test out um, APIs. Okay, um, so with GET, you you only receive the informations. So right, you you cannot actually write or send back the information to this API. You cannot send data. back to the APIs. You can also only receive uh, information using post. You, at the same time, you also have the right access. So, um, so you would need to have, uh, maybe you have, when you're sending a post request, you have, uh, you might need to specify what you need to input, right? So you, it might be in a key value format, or you can uh, you can write a new uh, a raw example file or when you are sending back this, um, this informations that are going to be put to the, that are going to be on added to the server, right? The, the data you are going to send back to the server. So, so um, yeah, this is what POST does. Um, so it's, so, uh, Okay, what else can we say about post? Um, so uh, we use uh, post to create, uh, we can use them to create a new entry, right? So the, the the other one is the put method. So we also use put method most often and we use it to update an existing resource, right? So let's, let's say um, using, if you have maybe updated or if, if you have, uh, sent a new data entry using the post and if you want to update this or you can if you want to make some changes to this um to the new data that you have entered then you can use the put method so if you, if you have your id and if you have um so you if you have if you know what if you have the identification which is usually it's going to be the id so uh, if you have the ID, and then you can make updates to the existing resources. And if you want to update some specific resources, um, it would have, so the URL is going is also going to change, right? It's going to have the ID in the URL, and you can call the put method to that resource URL. And with a request, you have, you can use different type of request in the body containing the, the, the new uh, type of data that you are trying to update with, right? So uh, let's, um, if you were, uh, I don't know, maybe first trying to, um, so if you had like a name that's, uh, let's say that could be, um, I don't know, Bob, then if you want, if you post this and I'm not sure this is going to be allow me, but if you post this to, yeah, this is not going to allow me. So if you post, if you have, so if at first when you were creating a new entry, then if you were creating it maybe with using only a name or an ID also, then so when you're uh, trying to update it, so you should also specify this the key values, right? So you need to specify the the keys, which could be the name or the ID or the amount. It could be anything that that you want to change, and you could you should also. Uh, be specifying the value with it so um so you need you need to so you can you can call the put method to that resource and you you have to um okay um is that question I'm 
okay so yeah that's what you could do um we also have a patch method um so what's it's also uh, commonly used and it's it's similar it's somehow similar to put method because it also modifies uh, an existing resource or an existing data right but the difference is that for for put method the, re the request body contains a completely new one right so as specified that uh, if you if you were trying to uh, put an update uh, someone called bob to to i don't know alice then you should um, so you you enter the a new version of the data right so but in patch method then the request body only sends sends it to to it needs to send it to a specific change to that resource so um you can only change you can you can only maybe send send out the name you don't need to send out the id or any other that's any uh, anything that's attached to that um resource um if that makes sense um so the request body only sends this the new uh changes to the resource right so uh, it's the set of instructions that's 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 going to describe how that resource should be changed, right? Uh, if you're going to change, uh, you, if you want to change, if you want to have the same ID and different type of name, that it should have that instruction, right? It should describe how that resource should be changed, and the API service will create a new version or according to that instruction, right? So um, another one is the delete method. Um, so we can also use the delete uh, method that's that's also common when we are working on APIs that it's as it's the name specifies it's going to delete a resource from that URL or from that a, from that collection or data res resources right so it's it's going to simply um, delete a specific resource so so these are the most common uh, it, API calls that you can make when you're working uh, on uh, APIs, right? So when you delete, then you have you actually usually when you need to give uh, the ID. So right, you have to specify the ID uh, when of the resource that you want to delete. So um, so you can use Postman to test out your APIs. Um, that's it's the most common way uh, to test APIs. Uh, you can also uh, Somehow, it, uh, Postman also has a VS Code and extension. I'm not sure if it's theirs, but there is also an, uh, a famous uh, that VS Code extension that's um, okay. I'm not sure the name, but let me, if I'm not mistaken, Tandu client or Rapidity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you can use both of them. So that also helps you uh, taste or use the use it right there in your VS Code and uh, without actually going back and forth to the Postman. So one feature that I really uh, like about um, Postman is that when you're testing or when you're making calls, then if you are um, so you can uh, I can taste this um, this API, right? I can maybe uh, get some request or anything. So it lets you, uh, it gives you access to the code. So you can actually uh, copy and paste this code in your, and and use it in your own code and how you can manage the response from it. And you can, so you can have different types. It has, so it can be in Python, it could be in Node, it could be Axios, or it could be Fetch. So it could be nat native or it could, it could be in the request form, and it has different types of um, programming languages that it outputs the this what you've been playing around with. So you can uh, so you can just um, work on the response that you get from the API, and you can get this code and inject it in your own code, and you can access the response and uh, continue working on. Um, your program. So yeah, that's that's basically a, a brief summary of APIs and how to play around and how to taste them. I hope that kind of gave you guys that gave you some introduction for those of you that were 
struggling last week. Um, this is just to get you guys started. Uh, maybe this should have been uh, the first weeks, but um, I hope you guys read more on it so that you can be better. But yeah, uh, if you have any question, you can ask. Uh, I think for today, this should be a, a short introduction. Yes, Joseph. Yes, uh, my question is, what next after reading the API, how to consume it? In practice. I said, um, like I said, so if you, so you can just make this API call. Uh, let's say if you're using Node, then maybe you can use, uh, there are libraries that, that lets you, that, that lets to access the response the responses from the apis so you can use maybe axios that's used in node that you can connect to this api endpoints to the urls and you can have headers and data sending to this uh, api or if, if you are making i don't know a post request but if you are trying to get access from those apis then you can just simply input your uh, url um, you, uh, and then um, some data if based on the, uh, the, re the requirements for the APIs that you are trying to, get, to connect. And um, so you can manipulate the response you get from the API, right? So you can use that response to data and then you can use it in your own, as your own need, right? So, um, so for example, if you were, when you were working on the PureStick APIs, if, so, if you were getting the transactions or if you were trying to if you if your api was giving you response of the amount of algos that you have left then you can use that uh, information you can use that response from that response data and you can uh, inject it in your application right so you can use a flask okay. or anything yes, just there. specifying the note Yes. Now, I think the, when we test the API using Postman, we see that the response is a JSON type, right? The output. Yeah, I, you can specify that as well if you want. You can have an HTML file or you can, maybe you can get it in a text format. It's not always a JSON. That's, you can choose your response type. When you are working on post now, and how to assess the information after and display it on maybe something? Okay. Hello. Okay. Um. So here, this. Um. Uh, here, this is. Your response. So this is going to be my response, right? Uh, let me just try to get uh, an actual successful response. So yeah. So this API is going to respond with a message uh, if a URL. So this is uh, going to generate a different uh, breed dog image. It's going to send me back an image, and this is going to be a link or a, a URL, right? So this is the message and. It could have different status. If it was failing, then the status could be failed or or something. So, this this is your response, right? So when so when you're working on Postman, you can just check it here, that right. But if you want it on, if, or if you're trying to access the code, then it would be as so it would be displayed as response, right? This is your response data. So if you take a look, then this um. This is going to be the response that you get from this. So if you maybe console log this, uh, this is the response could be this one, right? And uh, maybe if you if it's here if it's displayed in an array form, then if you are only trying to access the message part, you can sp specify the array index, and you can get that specific piece of information. If you let's say if you want the message, then maybe if it's specified at the first index then you can specify the array index and then get that information 
so you it would be displayed so this would be the the variable that's going to be storing or um showing your response right so this whole thing could be described here and you can you can i don't know you can store it in a in a variable and then man manipulate that variable and access the body of this uh response according to your need does that make sense yes yes it makes I have a question. Uh, in, uh, in, in this specific uh, point, so uh, I will be using this code, uh, the Node.js or the the Exos code, um, in which uh, code file I'm I'm using. For example, let's say I'm using Node.js uh, for the front end. So I'll be using this code in the in that specific in the same uh, front end code, right? Yeah, so you'd be using Node as uh, a backend, right? So, um, so you're going to use this, um, the response, and you can send it back to your front end. Maybe if you created an API endpoint, the then you can send it back to the user, or you can again access it, access it here, and you can store it in a variable and still um, make use of it. Yes. Yeah. So basically, my understanding is that the front end is an entire file and the back end is an entire file uh, uh, different entire file so i will be linking with the two files so that 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 sort of linking i'm, I'm missing so with this point i understand that it's not uh, two separated files it's a one file uh, that you could use every uh, that that you could use uh, the front end response or the back end response in each element, right? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. If you could maybe rephrase it. Of course, your front end and back end are two different files, right? You execute and run them a different way. So uh, they're not actually the same file. So there are different files that needs to somehow connect right so this one this api is could be the project of your backend so you can create uh this an api endpoint that generates a different breed of image of random dogs right so this is going to be uh your backend could, this is going to be the output of your backend and you can you're going to use the response of this one and send it to the front end right yes uh, Okay. So, uh, for example, uh, the the last week project, the Algorand project. So uh, I will be using, uh, I will be fetching data from the users like uh, the the public key or the addresses, and I will be sending that uh, to the to the backend so so that that I will be uh, sent uh, with the API with the Algorand Python SDK API. Uh, to the Algorand blockchain. So well, if you could elaborate or, or use that specific example to uh, to, okay. to elaborate more about how, how the communication is being. Okay. Okay, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, okay, I'm gonna try explain and let me know if that doesn't actually answer your question. So ideally, what last week project was supposed to do is that you have somehow uh, two pages that have the user, the trainer, and the admins, right? So, and then you have a backend. So, on the backend, you, you connect your, you connect it to the PureStake API. So, you you use the PureStake API, and then you get the responses from, I don't know what you were trying to access, but you get some, I don't know, maybe uh, if you were trying to uh, get, uh, let's say, amount, you, the amount you have, and you, you, you send a request to the uh, pure stake API, right? So, and then that request uh, sends you back a response, right? So, so that would be in your backend. Still, it's not going to be directly sent to your front end, right? You can directly uh, use you can use a smart contract that connect um, that 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 could store your the informations by connecting to the the to the your stake API, but if you can create your own API that you can manipulate the response that you get from the from the Algorand API, you might you might not need 
every information that they send you back to send it to the front end, right? So if you do not want that, you can you can make your own API endpoint and you can uh, maybe modify or you can uh, adjust it so that it suits your application needs, right? So the pure stake API is intended for a different type of use, right? So it may not be here to, it may not be generated or uh, made for so that it, it sends or mints an asset or just to um, transfer assets. It has, it could do many things, right? So if you, you could create your own API endpoint to access that that uh, API of the Algorand and then send back, send and connect your front end using your, your own API. That's one possibility that you could use. Or if you were, if you wanted, if, if you wanted to replace this whole backend API creating using the smart contract, then you you ha you could um, connect your the Algorand API to your smart contract. That's that smart contract should be deployed somewhere, right? Uh, it could be uh, on the Algo Explorer or something. You can deploy it there, right? So again, to access that, you use the URL and and then access it on your uh, front end or anything. Does, does that answer your question? So you can use your uh, Algorand API and then create your own API uh, so that it meets your uh, business needs or to meet your application need. I'm not yes, sure so that, that will be on the back end. My API yeah. uh, connecting to the Algorand API. All of this will be in the back end. Yes. And my API will be connecting to the front end uh, directly. Yes, exactly. Just like right. uh, how would you so create what I'm missing? What I'm missing is the type of the or the sort of connection between my API and the front end the front end. Th that specific connection. Okay, so uh I don't know if you're running your APIs locally, then uh, let you can you can assume that it's deployed and you can use your local network to access your APIs. So on the front end, uh, let's say if your um, API was running locally and it was using ports, I don't know, 80, 800, then you can you can you can assume that that's the URL, right? So that you can use it on your front end. You can use this uh, if you run it locally. You can use that URL and on the front end, and that should send you back a response. That should be the way you connect to your front end. Or if you have somehow oh. deployed your application on Heroku or any type of uh, hosting service, your back end only, then you can access it through the in the URL that they send you, and you connect. You can connect it to the front end. Okay, oh, uh, just for clarification, uh, okay. um, when I'm using uh, the front end, in the front end, I use, I'm i using React, and in the back end, my API, I'm using Fast API, for example. So uh, in, the, in the front end, I will be writing uh, a React uh, code that communicate with Fast API, which is my API, right? So I will be sending the the information that I gathered from the end user uh, to that API and waiting for my API to connect to the Algorand API and fetch me that data and give it me back, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, understood that very clearly. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, yes, Patrick, is that a question? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, about about API, uh, Abhijat asked about uh, if if you can connect backend and frontend. So let me ask. Uh, think about something that I, I always ask myself. So uh, is it because I, I developed Django application that did, didn't need an API? Let's say. You don't need an API from other other source. Like you don't need other people's data. You will need your own data in your in your project. 
uh, why will you use an API to to uh, to, to make front end talk to back end when you can directly call the data from the from back end? Directly okay, call is that call? Call call, call, like we... like for example in 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 Django there is uh there is something called Ginger. You you write your okay. code you write your code you, like you make your database in Django and then write your code there. Then you write uh, HTML CSS for front end. Then you you write Ginger into like directory into into your HTML. Then call call uh, data from uh, from your database and show it to the uh, on on user interface. So. Is that also called API calling? Or? Um, I don't think that's 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 going to be considered as API call. I'm not sure. Uh, I've never actually worked with Jinja, but um, can I isn't it like? Answering? Huh? Can I attempt answering it? Maybe. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. It's so like uh, there is a different kind of in web uh, there is a kin different kind of like rendering and information so there is a server side rendering and there is a client side rendering so like throughout the projects we've been using this uh, client side rendering the client side rendering means like you separately write the uh, client side uh, or the front end application and your server will be an external entity that you can call through an api call but what you're mentioning is that uh, if you're using a server side rendering there is uh, so like the front end reside in the server so the server sends just an html uh an html body to the browser in that case you don't need uh, an api a restful api per se uh, to like uh, fetch or to consume data from your let's say database or for like from your like local file system and so forth so like so you can use like templating engines and different like methods to inject your data into your html body so uh, so in that case you don't need a uh, and a, a restful API. Restful API comes comes into play when you trying to uh, have, for example, different uh, client clients, different clients being, for example, you might have a mobile application or another front end application that is written in uh, Angular or React. Uh, those are, for, for for example, are called a single page application because they uh, look like and feels like a mobile application and most of like the data or the code the javascript lives in your browser so like when you uh, fetch for example when you fetch a single page application you first like get all the javascript bundle and your browser just compiles it and the data comes in later through an API call. So in this case, you need an API. So maybe uh, a digit, it might also like answer your question. You don't need uh, a restful API to uh, connect your front end with your back end if you're uh, using like a server side rendering. Uh, so like the, this has been like the trend uh, throughout like uh, when we start Web two, right? So like PHP uh, being the, I think the pioneer, the ASP.NET, and there there are also other like uh, uh, language uh, languages that use the same kind of uh, like server side uh, rendering, like the same kind of way of like building a web application. So uh, does it make sense, Patrick? Yeah, it does make sense. But I was uh, the question was uh, I was wondering if it's always the 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 case to use API to connect to for uh, front end to back end. But now I understand. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then, um. Yes. Uh, you can you you can continue with the question. 
Okay, uh, my question is not actually associated with this uh, lesson. Um, I ask sure, depends on what it is. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, just I want uh, it is a key question. Just I have uh, connected to the AWS. Then after that, uh, as it uh, are we uh, are we going to install all the Conda and other software um, here? Okay, so. That's good that you've connected. Congrats uh, first. Uh, so you, we can, and we're going to install the Kafka on the AWS. So, uh, so you don't have, uh, you don't actually need to install any other thing. So you, do you want to install Conda? I mean, someone in your group has a sudo access, so you can, you can, you can install uh, Conda, or you can install and. Uh, work on whatever you want, but make sure that if you have, if you're the one and you having the root access, are you the one having the root access in your group? No, I don't think so. Uh, Nathaniel is our uh, leader. Okay, so, so probably he would have a root access, so that means he can install uh, some applications that you need. Uh, so yes, you you can in install the the things you need, but some of the basic ones, the Kafka and uh, so we will definitely make sure to install those for you before. Okay, so that we can access the notebook from our yes. terminal. Uh, you can actually still access your uh, terminal right now, uh, the notebook. But something, uh, something there is some issue with your uh, username and passport, password. But that was the issue. But you can still access your uh, notebook on your brother or on your browser or on your VS code right now. Uh, we will actually, uh, if all your team, team members are, if they are connected, then we would have some session on how to we would, how to uh, connect to the notebook and, or some guidance. We would have some guidance to help you on that. If okay, that's thanks, a thanks concern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the issues are on our side, so we are trying to solve that before we're actually giving you guys some commands uh, on what to actually do next. So that's for the delay. Uh, I think you're from group one, so. Yeah, yeah. I think you're the only person that has connected, if I'm not mistaken, but as soon as the rest of your teammates are connected and are have actually made a successful connection, then we will definitely give you some guidance on what to do next. But okay. uh, anyone with the root access can install uh, what you want. <clears throat> oh, and make sure that not to mess up things because having the, the the root comes with great responsibility. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, do we have um, any other question? All right. So um, I'm going to stop the recording if we don't have any more questions.